Please open your New Testaments to James chapter 5. We want to look at a couple of verses there. So this will be a sermon that centered around an analysis of these verses. And of course it's basic to our conduct as Christians having to do with our prayers and our needs to help each other, to be forgiving. James 5, 16, and then verses 19 through 20. Let's read that before we begin. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Then drop down to the last two verses in the book. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. But I remind you that James writes this to Christians. So this sermon is designed to help us as brothers and sisters in Christ in living the Christian life in this area. James is writing here to brethren concerning the very process whereby one sins. More specifically, James dealt with certain sins that the brethren addressed in this particular letter had committed. In these particular verses, the inspired James dealt with how to gain forgiveness of sins that brethren commit against one another. Notice he said, confess your faults. ASV 1901 says sins one to another. Just as a superficial comment about this, when people are that willing before each other as brothers and sisters in the family of God, all having believed and from the heart obeyed the gospel, desirous of being forgiven of sins, becoming accepted to God, justified in His sight, all on the same road, all having the same needs, all in the same fellowship, then it becomes rather obvious they are cultivating humility, meekness, and a proper response to the authority of God and the realization of what John wrote about that we just finished studying in 1 John. That we have never reached the stage where we're in this life going to not need to confess our sins. Now it may be that those sins are privately done and known only to you and to God. And I've always said, common sense says, that when you commit that kind of sin, then repent of it and confess it in the way it was committed privately. It may be that in a family situation, one of the family members may sin against another family member. It's not known outside that family. And thus, repent of it there and confess it. That's where it belongs. Keep it there. One of the things we must remember is that we don't want to spread sin beyond the boundaries of where it was committed. That's not good for you nor anybody else. Brother Guy Woods told me years ago, and this will probably go back to the 1930s, that there was a preacher in West Texas and was quite well known in a given area. Used a lot in meetings, so he had that kind of uh, knowledge about him. And he committed some sort of sin. I don't know what it was. Didn't need to know. But when he tried to correct it, he confessed it far beyond the borders of where it was known. Published it in papers of his repentance. Well, you don't want to do that. Not because you're proud and haughty. But you need to repent of the sin and take care of it as to those 
it pertains to. But going back to what I said, the superficial comment, confession of sins one to another where it's needed, where it's called for, keeps us all humble. So we all need that as, unless you decided that you're humble enough, and that probably means you're not. So we all need to do a self-evaluation when it comes to that kind of thing. But remember, actual confession of sin indicates something, and here's the important part, must have taken place before the confession of the actual fault or sin, and that's repentance. When you confess sin, you're confessing, I've already recognized it, and I've already repented of it. And I want my brethren to know whoever needs to know. So when a child of God has sinned, there must be a beginning point for that church member for starting over again. And what is that point? The confessing of one's sins is that point. Now, if you say that's not the point, where is it? Because when you confess sins, that evidence is you've already done what you had to do when it came to repentance. Now, by instructing the brethren to confess their sins to one another, James was not implying that one should not confess his or her sins to God. That's not the point. And here's why. All sin being the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3 and verse 4. All sins are ultimately and foremost against God. Our sins may involve other people, but all sin is ultimately against God. A good example of this is David's own confession of his sins as related to Bathsheba. And you can see that in David's Psalm chapter or Psalm 51 and specifically verse 4 of Psalm 51 where he acknowledges I've sinned against thee and thee only have I sinned. Well involved with the people, didn't it? But he means it wouldn't have been a sin if he hadn't violated God's law so he opposed God when he violated God's law though it involved other people. But again, where one's sins are Christian sins against God involves unauthorized acts against brethren, uh, say such as a sin of the respect of persons or whatever it might be, or for that matter, anyone else. Such sins have not been scripturally dealt with by the sinner until the sin is being confessed to the person who was sinned against. Let's bring it down pretty intimately. A husband and wife were Christians. One spouse sins against another spouse in something they did in the way they acted or whatever. It would be ridiculous for the spouse that sinned to come before the church and confess that sin, and yet they don't confess it to the spouse they sinned against. That could be true of a personal friend or another brother or sister in Christ. So surely that's a bit of common sense rule of interpretation of the scriptures and the application of this to see where it needs to go. Well, after such confession has been made, James declared that brethren are to pray one for another that you may be healed. We don't usually think of sin as being that which is a malady from the standpoint of I broke my arm or something like that. But it does indicate a malady, a breakdown in spiritual conduct. There has been a wound. And we see that we need that kind of healing. And this is the way you, this is the way you start the healing. Is first of all individually coming to grips with it yourself. And then knowing what needs to be done. When a brother is exhibited, or what we would simply say is a contrite and penitent heart, how did one do that? By confession of sin 
But beginning with the one sinned against, if it's only one, husband to a wife, wife to a husband, a brother in Christ to another brother in Christ, whatever, then both persons are in a position to go to the Father to request forgiveness for the one that is a penitent brother or sister. So the healing that is spoken of by James in keeping with the context of the passage is then forgiveness of sins, not some physical malady, but forgiveness of sin. I think I would like to tie that in because most everybody here has been in the class on Wednesday night. And we're able to see that John talks about the fellowship that exists between the brethren and God and the brethren and one another. That sharing that we have in a special way because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Nobody else has that but faithful members of the church with one another. So when one sins against another in the church, we have built a wall that has destroyed a certain amount of that fellowship. And that needs to be taken care of. First of all, remember, we are in fellowship one with another scripturally because each one of us are first of all in fellowship with God. So our fellowship must be vertical between us and God before we extend fellowship horizontally to one another because we all have believed and obeyed the same gospel and are living according to the same teaching of God's word. And what's wonderful about it is God stands ready to forgive. If we could just get it into our heads that God doesn't want to see any of us lost. He doesn't want to see anybody in this world lost. That's one of the great points made, if not the point, of 2 Peter 3, 9. God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. But notice, we're free moral agents. We have free will. We must choose to follow him. We must choose to believe in his way of saving us and meet him by complying with the terms of pardon. Whether it be becoming a Christian so that alien sin, sins that separate us from God originally are forgiven, or whether in Christ and we're dealing with something that James is dealing with here. So God is able and God is willing to provide his blessings in this. It's something to rejoice in and to know that. As I said, John earlier said if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now that's an exact parallel here. And James is telling us when that happens, when we confess our sins, as does John. And when we do, and we ask for forgiveness, he will forgive. So God doesn't want to see any of us. But notice, especially those who've heard and believed the gospel, we're his children. And we want them to be our children. We want them to be what all they should be. And we work with them. We're patient with them, hopefully. We suffer along with them. If we want God to suffer along with us and our frailties, then we ought to want to extend that same merciful attitude toward others. It doesn't mean we tolerate sin. We urge people always to look in their lives and see their sins and do away with them in the way the Bible teaches as such is done. But at the same time, time goes on. All this stuff we talked about this morning, we've talked about, and John had it in his prayer, and we look about through all of it. But God still is saying, I'm waiting. I'm still giving you time to come to your senses. Still giving you time to listen to the truth. Still giving you time to break down your old stubborn will. Still giving you time to know you can't make it to heaven on your own. No other human beings can take you to heaven. And I'm still waiting. And I'm still giving you all those things that you have in the physical world. And sometimes we just don't think about that. Do you realize how much grace has been poured out on us just to be born in America concerning physical matters, concerning material things? While we are basking, just 
Don't even think about for a moment the grace of the gospel that saves us from sin. Think about the grace of God that has poured out all that we have. Just to be born into America was to be born into the favor of the Almighty God. He, we didn't have to be. If you look at it from, from uh, how the percentage that we would be here, the high percentage would be we'd be born somewhere else. But we were born here. Now, the only thing when I think about that is what an obligation falls on my shoulders that we have this blessing that others have never had. To be born in these United States when the Bible and the religion of the Bible can be freely practiced. In so many places, that's not the case. So we have that. What are we using it for? The healing or the forgiveness of sins is provided by God. And notice it's provided on the basis for the righteous man. That's who we're talking about. For the righteous one through an effectual, fervent prayer. Look at the words effectual and fervent. One's heart's into it. We're feverish in our intent that we want it. I say go back and read Psalm 51, and you'll see just exactly what it's like to understand effectual and fervent. Of course, that's preceded by the confession of sins, which evidence is repentance. And of course, if the sin were one of which other brethren were aware, then I've already pointed out, they too would be petitioning God on our behalf. Think about for a moment the situation with the newly converted Simon, as we know him, the sorcerer in Samaria, Philip preaching the gospel. and Yet he fell back into his old ways when he saw that the apostles, by laying on of hands, could confer miraculous gifts on each person. He didn't just want a miracle. He wanted the power to confer miracles and sought to buy it with money. Well, Peter severely rebuked him. And then he, evidencing what I think is penitence, pled with Peter to pray on his behalf that none of these things would come upon him. Well, that's what it ought to be with us, that none of these things would come upon us. I read here a few years ago, and I don't know how this statistic still is today, I would think it would be more as far as the number is concerned. But that 5,000 people die every day in the United States. Does that sound right? Maybe higher than that. Every day, 5,000 people die. And then you think about it for a minute. Those of that number who are not accountable to God for their actions, infants and such like, they haven't reached the age of where they're accountable to God. In other words, then we know they're taken care of in their innocency. But they never reached the stage of sinning. But a good many of them die lost every day. Every day. I don't know how many of that 5,000 would be, but I know every one of them that's accountable to God and they haven't obeyed the gospel or living faithful. I know exactly what happens to them. The moment they die. And remember, James says that the spirit apart from the body is dead. That's a biblical definition of what death is. The real you in this body leaves. I don't know exactly how long it takes for that to happen. I think it's, the brain's dead in about between two and three minutes when blood ceases to flow from it and take the oxygen to it. So that quick, they enter into eternity. And I promise you, sadly, most all of them are unprepared. And immediately, they open their eyes where the rich man is. As it is said of him by Jesus, and Luke recorded it, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. And whatever was here on this earth that was unpleasant, they are in a place that is so far beyond 
our mortal minds to grasp. But they made that place for themselves because they did not use life to find God and serve Him. They sought to live as they wanted to live. It must be emphasized that a righteous person is a commandment keeper. Psalm 119 verse 172 because all of God's commandments are righteousness. And we must therefore understand that if we die righteous, we, do, we die commandment keepers. That's another way of saying you're faithful to God. So for one to be righteous, he must be a keeper of God's commandments. To reject the scriptural view of keeping God's commandments is to reject the very process that God has ordained whereby men become righteous before him and are thereby qualified in the sight of God our Father to offer up the prayer that's described in James 5 and verse 16. Now, if you look on over to the latter part of the chapter, the last two verses, we read them a moment ago. In studying those two verses, 19 and 20, one thing is immediately apparent that James was reminding faithful brethren of, and that is faithful brethren, commandment keepers, the righteous, the justified, those reconciled to God in the church, they have a responsibility, they have an obligation toward erring brethren. Listen again, brethren. Can't get plainer than that. He's addressing brethren. If any of you err from the truth and one convert him. Let him know, that is the one that did the converting, that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a, way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. This is my opinion. You can take it for whatever it's worth. This teaching is probably more neglected by more churches and just about any other obligation that God expects the church to discharge that members of the church may be faithful. I don't know how many times over the years that in visitation programs where you try to go check on people, and tailor your visit to the needs of the people and sometimes to find out if there are any needs. Maybe they're not members. You're trying to study the Bible with them. Maybe they're being uh, evidencing by their conduct or lack of it that they're weak or that maybe they're just unfaithful. And some of them, more than like to remember, took umbrage at the fact that you were there and checking on them. And some brethren have been quick to criticize others. You don't check on me, you don't check on me, but they love to play hide and seek. And the more you try to find them, the more they try to hide, and then the more they try to say, where were you? Because we shift blame when we don't want to repent of it. We shift blame. We want to say it's your fault. And I always remind you, that's from the beginning been here. Adam blamed Eve and ultimately God for his sin. The woman thou gavest me, she did give me and I did eat. Look who he said that to. He said it to God. That wasn't the way he felt about her when he first created her for him. But we passed the buck. I do not like to be. It's in my nature and I need to know that about it. And If you don't admit it, then you're worse off than I am. We don't like to say I was wrong. And if we do say I was wrong, we like to say, but look, you had a part in it. You're partly the reason. Well, that doesn't work. And if you look again at Psalm 51, David didn't try to say Bathsheba should have been on top of her house taking a bath where I'm walking on top of my house. I can look and see her. Well, she played as much thing in this as I. Well, if she did, whatever she needed to repent of. When you read Psalm 51, David says, it's on me. I'm dealing with my sin. I'm dealing with what I was responsible for. And one of the more easier sins to commit by you and me is the sin of omission. You know why it's easy, easy to commit? 
do nothing. You just omit it. You just never get around to doing what God obligated you to do. You just, you just go ahead and do whatever it is. And that comes back to let George do it. <laughs> it's amazing on these things how easy it is for us to fall into a trap. Uh, too many brethren are long on talking about someone else and what someone else ought to have done. But then we get terribly remiss, I'm afraid, when it comes to seeing what we have left undone. And there ought to be the attitude of, what lack I yet? Not, isn't this enough? And yet, brethren, over the years have at times says, well, how little can I do? And heaven will be my home. Well, you really don't want to go to heaven when you're that way. You think you do, but that Satan sold you a, sold you a bill of goods, and they're worthless. Because that's saving your conscience to say, that's not that important. And some people, I don't know how to, all these years in, in dealing with it, I don't know how to, how to say anything other than that individual person has to deal with himself. But one of the first signs of a person departing from the faith is when they miss the assemblies of the saints. We just do not realize the value of assembling with saints and together with them worshiping God and getting the benefit of the singing, the prayers, the Lord's Supper, the association, the strength that comes from all of that, the giving of our means, all of that. Now, God knew what he was doing when he said that we were to assemble on the first day of the week. Yes, we direct our worship to him according to the authorized will, and the assembly itself is authorized. But the things done in that assembly directed to God are for our benefit. Did you recognize, I don't know whether... Our good song leaders, I called him this morning uh, when he moved this up here. I said, you're a good deacon. <laughs> Brett sang songs here today. Most of them would be hymns that are designed to exhort each other and to remind one another of our duty to God and to one another in day-to-day -day Christian living and the hope we have in Christ and so forth. Brethren, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, we need all the help we can get. If we just understood how powerful Satan is and how he can manipulate us so easily. So when it comes to leaving matters undone, especially when our emotions get all involved in it, have you noticed that our country today, forget the church just for a minute because we're in this country, whether we're, no matter how faithful we are or not, we're still in our society and our culture. Have you noticed how many people today operate strictly on feel goodism? Emotional, I call it huggyism. <laughs> You don't have to give any facts. You don't have to give any factual solutions to a problem. Here's what you have to do. Whatever question is that calls for a definitive answer, you just simply say, I feel your pain. And that answers it. They're happy. They haven't heard anything. They haven't heard any particular plan to get anything done. But just so that particular person says, let me give you a hug. That's what you need right now. Okay, you give me the hug. You pat me on the back. You smile at me. But I'm still in the mess I'm in. What are you going to do about getting me out? What am I going to do? Do you have anything to guide me? Now look at religion in that situation. And you'll see it's the same thing. And so they look at God the same way. And they say, oh, I'm so sorry. You don't change your life. God loves you. God cares for you. 
And so you feel good. You keep on in the same actions that are wrong you've been keeping on. But God, you know, God loves you. God's gracious. And God's merciful. But you don't change your ways. The Bible's the word of God. But I don't study it. But I feel good. But you can feel good in your sins because there is a way that is, seems right, not is, but seems right, to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You'll never find the gospel approaching people on, I feel your pain, and that's all you get. I'm not saying that Jesus didn't come so he could empathize with us because he's as human as you are, and I am. But he also offers a plan, and we call it the plan of salvation. He also requires of you a turning in your mind and a turning from sin to him. That's repentance. He requires you to believe. He requires you to comply with his will. To be like him. To bring every thought and subjection to Jesus Christ. And I don't know where his thoughts are except in his last will and testament. So I have to study it and learn those thoughts. Would you look at our country and see how many people really don't want to change? They just all want to have a, a feel-good session. And then they go back out doing what they used to. There, there are people, back in the 60s, there was this idea, you're going to church and loving it less. And that was the beginning of a lot of this stuff as it began to take over. And so what they were getting at is you come into the worship assembly and you don't feel anything because, see, it's all on a level of emotion and feelings. And so you leave, and you're still just the biggest mess you were. But if you can get into the worship, what they call worship, and have some sort of an emotional fit of some kind of other, then you leave feeling better. But see, all that's like too much ice cream and whipped cream. It just fades away in a hurry. You know, you get a sugar high. That's exactly what's happening when they do this. When they go into these so-called worship periods, they get a spiritual sugar high. Guess what happens to sugar highs? falls flat real quick and you feel worse than you did. What happens is, is that during the week they're not striving to seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, studying the Bible, praying, trying to carry out God's will. They haven't changed their lives. And what they're looking for is a quick fix to feel better. And they want that emotional high. And if they don't get that emotional high, you're not spiritual. So you go to church, you leave, and that's what they were trying to do. People didn't see through that. But that new view was saying you have a big three-ring circus. And that's where all this thing started. It's to make everybody feel like man on the flying trapeze or what, everything. Bring in the clowns, whatever. Because people sought that spiritual sugar high. And they failed to realize Christianity is lived day in and day out. Your bodies are living sacrifices to God. That's your reasonable service. And the sacrifice comes by your living as the New Testament teaches. So this is what happens. And too many people, well, listen, we, we've all been affected by it. If we don't realize it, we just want a mushy, mushy one together. And we just have this ooey gooey feeling. And aren't they so spiritual? Well, what does the Bible say? I don't know what it feels so good. That's where we are. And that's permeated this whole country. Then you take the pure old secularism, materialism. It doesn't care one way or the other. It likes the good feelings, but it gets it through dope and through whiskey and through whatever else. That's how it gets its sugar high. Through sex and all that. And the perversions. Because they live totally and completely to gratify the sensual part of us, which is the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And that's what it means. Don't you know when the Bible talks about men who are womanizers, to be nice about it, that's nice. The Bible calls it what it is, whoremongers. You can train yourself to have that kind of ungodly appetite. And you can train yourself to be a homosexual, to be a transvestite, to be whatever. You train yourself, even if they're going against nature, what you naturally are, what you were born into. 
And that's how they do it. But then you got the religious sugar highs, then you got the worldly sugar highs. None of it has any basis. It all goes away. But we have the solid truth of God and the Word of God that tells you exactly what you must believe and do to be safe from your sins, to be a Christian, to live right, worship God, and serve Him. And this is a point that gets missed so much. And so, if we don't watch out, we omit Bible study, we omit prayer, we omit so many things that are designed to help us. And so the sin of omission becomes a very easy one for us to, to commit. I, I don't know how many here know anything about parliamentary procedure, but in parliamentary procedure to, quote, table, unquote, any motion is to remove that motion indefinitely from any kind of consideration. It's long been a ploy in legislative bodies to table a motion. And that simply says, forget about that. Well, suffice it to say that with many in the church, the legislation of our Lord regarding the conduct of members of the church, the responsibility of faithful members toward erring members, has been tabled. So I can describe it. And I've known and I know of some elders who are very good at tabling a motion. And it's simply out of sight, out of mind. And these elders are extremely capable of keeping things out of sight. Yeah, willfully ignorant to a great extent. It's much easier to compliment than to rebuke. Think about that. Don't you find it much easier to say, well, oh, we're happy with what you've done than it is, you knew better than that. <laughs> or maybe you didn't. Or let's study this more to see why you were wrong. I'd lot rather be complimenting folks all the time. But one thing that's bad is for the person just to sit there and let sin go on and nothing done about it except we've tabled it. Paul charged brethren with the same obligation to the erring that James did here when he wrote, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault or a trespass, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Galatians 6, 1. Now there, Paul, to the church of Galatia, and here, James, to all the people he wrote to, a general epistle, you're saying the same thing. You must be mindful of your brethren. When a faithful member recognizes that a brother or sister is in physical need, he understands that brotherly love demands what? That he strive to alleviate that member's deprivation. By the way, James also dealt with that in chapter 2 of James, verses 15 and 16. And you know how he did it? And showing us the kind of faith that saves us, a live faith over against a dead faith. Even so, faith that it hath not works is dead, being alone. Yea, a man say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. That's another way of saying you can't do it. Just think for a minute. I'm going to show you my confidence, belief, and faith in God and His system of salvation, but I'm not going to do a thing He says. Now, how are, you going, how are you going to show that faith? You can't. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Watch it. But wilt thou know, and look what James says, O vain man, O empty man, that faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works? And I always want to say here, we do see that, don't we? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works? And by works was faith made perfect, which means complete. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Notice back before he started this little discourse from verse 17 down. 
He says, if a brother or sister be naked in destitute daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Well, think about that when it comes to spiritual conduct. A brother or sister is engaged in something that's sinful. It's breaking God's law, and that separates them from God. What do we do? So, well, we hope it all work out for you. Or we'll give them a pat on the back, wish you the best, stick with it. And we don't try to point out the details. The problem specifically. I'm reminded of the little boy whose father was sick and could not attend worship assembly one day, but sent his son on down to worship. When he got back home, the father asked him, well, what did the preacher preach about? He said he preached about sin. He said, well, what did he say about it? He said he was again it. Well, I don't know anybody that preaches that doesn't, uh, would not say, I'm against sin. Can you see any of these preachers of any of these kinds of churches around us saying, I'm for sin that transgresses God's will and separates you and will send you to hell. That's what I'm for. No, they're always against sin. Now, I don't know what all they call sin, but they've got something they're against. But it's hard to get anybody down to specifics. Have you ever tried to ask them specifically, do you believe the practice of homosexuality is sin, and if you practice that, you'll lose your soul? Ask that today among a lot of people and see what kind of definitive, plain answer you get. You'll find out people get very politically correct when that happens. And if you want to see one that's really good on dodging, Joel Osteen. And he is a good example of a whole host of preachers when it comes to asking a plain, pointed question. And you'd think he was running for president. No answer. Dodge. You know, the Bible teaches us we're not supposed to be that way. We're supposed to give an answer plainly, forthrightly, as to what we believe. I liked what was said, and I heard it from people who went to school to him. Brother N.B. Hardiman used to say concerning when he was president of Freed Hardiman, and days long gone by, but I wish they would return, that you can... Ask me any position, what the position of Freed Hardeman is. And I can answer you on the back of a penny postcard, still have room to say, and how's your Aunt Bertha? Well, you may not be able to go into a full discourse on it, but you can say yes or no. We do or we don't. And if you want to know more, I'll explain it to you. Do you people believe that baptism is for the remission of sins? Yes. Well, I don't. Well, you asked me what I believe and told you. If you want to know more, let's study the Bible and just see. Do you folks believe in the worship assembly of the saints on the first day of the week, every first day of the week, that you must observe the Lord's Supper? Yes. Anything else you want to know? And so on you go. We need to be that definitive and that plain. But we need to be also an opportunity to be able to explain how we arrived at that conclusion. So we don't need to be of the mindset to commit the sin of omission by tabling the motion, which so supposedly just gets it out of the way. We know from Matthew 18, 15 through 17 that Jesus gave that to show how to solve sins that committed between two brethren and known only to them and to God originally. I want to emphasize that. I've seen false teachers use this to say, well, before you taught this publicly in rebuking me for what you said was false teaching that I did, did you come to me with it? That's not dealing with that. This is talking about, let's say Brett and I got into it. He was wrong, I was right. But <laughs> we got into it over something. I put myself in the place of the sinner. And I sinned against him. And I say that's known only between us two and God because God knows all things. 
And Brett comes to me and says, points out whatever it was. Now, if I'm what I ought to be, then I'm of a disposition of mind to say, you're right, Brett. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Let's have a word of prayer together. That ends it. It ends right where it started. Now, that's what you've got in Matthew 18. It's not meant to stop people from rebuking publicly false teaching and false teachers who taught it publicly. I've always told them, you can come to me before you taught it publicly. Why should I come to you for? I rebuke you publicly. That's totally a different thing. This is a private sin. And thus you have the direction of what happens if that person that, was, that did the sinning in this case in Matthew 18 doesn't respond properly in the example I gave. Then there's two or three witnesses to be brought in this case by Brett to me to get me to, to, to change my ways and repent. If that doesn't work, then it's put before the whole church. And the whole church is to bring to bear their righteous conduct on that person that sinned. And if the, he won't hear the whole church, in this case my example, I wouldn't hear the whole church, then I'm to be withdrawn from. Now each case be handled on its own merits. Brett might want to come to me several times before he went to and brought witnesses. Might want to just see how stubborn I am. But then again, it might not be. Then when he comes with two or three witnesses, he may want to come more than once. And of course, you'd have elders involved. The church is organized, or organized like it ought to be when it comes before the whole church because I don't think the whole church can be involved in something if the shepherds of the flock don't know what's going on. Because they're part of the church too. They would have to be acting. And that's the way it's done. But if such a person continues whatever sin it may be, then you find Paul dealing with such a thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 6 through 7, where a man was engaged in fornication. There wasn't even named among the licentious Gentiles, the Corinthians, having his father's wife. And he told them, don't have anything to do with him. Delivering to Satan, so to speak. Let him go. Don't, don't give him any kind of encouragement in this. Don't have the association you had, the fellowship you had. Pull it away from him. I don't think we appreciate that that much because in those days if a person truly was converted to Christ as the Son of God and obeyed the gospel, they had made big advances toward that way. And now, lo and behold, he's about to have to go out here among these people who hate the church and hate Christ and hate the gospel because he can't have association with the church. In other words, it had power over him when the church withdrew the fellowship from him that he couldn't find anywhere else and that he had been enjoying to make him see him. Self for what he was, separated from God by his sin, engaged in sinful activity, even worse than the ungodly people around him, and be brought to repentance. So all of the action in Matthew 18 is taken because the faithful brethren love the soul of the one in sin as well as the purity of of the Lord's church. If a sinner, and we know he's a sinner, is allowed to remain as if he is a faithful brother or sister, he will, in time, corrupt the whole church. And a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So when a brother or sister sins or of a public nature, then they're to be dealt with in one way. Let's close on this. The fruit of the righteous is as a tree of life, and he that is wise winneth souls. Proverbs 11.30. Proverbs 11.30. You know, none of us, none of us, when we're fully honest and thinking like we ought to, want to see any one of us lost on the day of judgment. We want each one of us to be in heaven together. The Lord has the remedy. Just as surely as he has the plan of salvation whereby one becomes a Christian, then he has a second law of pardon. Repentance, confession of sin, 
prayer to God for forgiveness. But it's not just the one that sinned and has an obligation. It's also the faithful who have an obligation in bringing that person to repentance. It's not pleasant. It's a lot easier to commend people. But when we see our brethren commit a trespass, then we ought to be concerned enough to try to bring them to repentance. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, then we would love and we pray that such can be that you would obey the gospel because you're lost. If you died right now, being accountable to God for your actions, there's no hope for you. You shouldn't have any peace of mind knowing that if you're outside of Christ. If you've never contacted the blood of Christ, you've never believed in Him, you've never repented of your sins, you've never confessed before men your faith in Christ as the Son of God, you've never been baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. You ought to be scared to death that before you get home today, you'll step into that eternity and lift up your eyes being in torment. Because that's what immediately is going to happen. And thousands a day do that. I don't know how many in the whole world, but thousands a day in the United States. But you see, you don't have to. You can be prepared. God's granted you in His good providence and love of your soul to give you this opportunity to obey the gospel. Now, why won't you? Parents and friends and your brethren pray for you that you'll respond to the truth. And if you're a child of God and caught up in sin and just too stubborn to repent of it, why? You obeyed the gospel one time, fully recognizing you needed forgiveness of sins. Christ, through the gospel and His mercy, offered it to you, and you responded. You were baptized to Christ. So what has got you back in the wrong way? What have you allowed to take over? What lie have you believed that Satan's put out to you that makes you think you can live in that kind of life? Whatever it is, one sin. If any brother be overtaken in a trespass, you don't have to deny the whole thing. Just get caught up in a sin. You know it's a sin, but you haven't repented of it. Repent of it. Be honest. Honest with yourself. Honest with the truth. Honest with your brethren. And above all, Honest with your God who gave his son to die for you. Please obey the gospel and do so now while we stand and sing.